don't even really remember how, how we met. I mean, we were going to school together. I saw him around campus a lot. And he... He always did this hop thing that used to drive me crazy, but it was fine. I mean, it was... <laughs> It was alright. He was really sweet and really cute. And he was funny. He was really funny. There were so many times that we would, um, we'd have these great conversations, all these philosophy class stuff, and we'd just go off constantly getting into arguments with him and I wasn't even arguing with him but he would just go off and lose his shit and I I just sit there and get completely confused start crying. I never completely knew what was going on in his head. But I think that's what I loved about him the most. So I was always curious what was gonna happen next, you know. Well, I mean, it was no secret that, basically, he hated his father. I mean, all I did was bitch about him and hang up on him, wouldn't speak to him. Months would go by. I think a year went by, he didn't speak to his mom one time. But uh, he got this check. He got this check for like 150 grand. Sent this letter saying, you know, thanks, but no thanks. And forever you're obeying the son, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, wait a minute, you're giving it back? What are you doing? And he just, he just wanted to have a relationship with his father. He didn't really, he didn't really care about the money. He knew he was being, he knew he was being, I don't know. I guess that night was the night he, um, what was it, he went to that, to that church? I forget exactly where it was. I know the church, though. I can see it in my head, but he went and, um, he was crying. He was pounding on the doors of this church, and then he told me something about running into this little girl. This little girl needed his help. And he was too upset with his own crap, so he couldn't really pay any attention. She was lost, I think. He saw a mother with her baby. He found, he found some kind of, I don't know, epiphany or something that night. He was all right after that, but it was like the whole thing, just banging on the church. It was just, I don't know, he was mad at somebody. He was definitely mad at his father, but he was blaming God for, blaming God for his Tourette's, basically. Blaming God for giving him this condition, and why me? And he said something like, I don't know, you're my enemy. Where were you when I needed you? Every time, <laughs> and I mean every time, he would go off the deep end about something. He was always threatening to kill himself, and he tried to um, swallow, I think, a whole bottle of Valium. And he knew it wasn't going to do any good. Pretty sure, he, pretty sure he took them all, but then he just threw it all up. He slept. He slept and he was pretty much comatose. I think he said he slept really well for the first time in a long time. Well, we met in Miss Anderson's philosophy class. And, uh, what were we going over? Essence and existence or essence I don't even remember. God, it was so long ago. He always used to get into, <laughs> he always used to get into these fights with Ms. An uh, Mrs. Anderson. He would just 
completely go ballistic on her, just get into all these arguments with God. He was really battling God a lot. And the funny thing is that Ms. Anderson, she would like, she would almost provoke him. She was almost initiating an argument with him. She would just get, just to get him going, just, I don't know, maybe to get some excitement in the class. It was freaking boring. And he would just, he would just start debating God with her and the existence of God, and if God is nothing, then we have no right to exist, but if God is everything, then this existence means nothing, and it's like, well, hey, hang on. I mean, I understood it at the time, but now that I think about it, it's just a debate in semantics, you know, it has nothing to do with anything. Oh yeah, I met up with those two. Those two went off without me, just pissing me off, and I knew I had to catch up to them. They went out that night. They, I don't know, they went out, I think, at like midnight to go out, go out and get drunk, and they ended up hanging out in the park somewhere. And then I heard, um, I heard him bitching about me to Fitzy, and Fitzy was right there and saw me coming up and heard Nolan like just going to town, off bitching at me, bitching about me. And then um, uh, there was this. Um, well, Fitzy split, and then there was this bum that showed up. This guy, he was begging for some change. <laughs> this is the, I think this is definitely my favorite story about, about him. Uh, the bum was like, you know, hey, you know, you got any spare change? He was this big old fat, poor guy. He was just, you know, he hadn't bathed in years, and he was wearing like ripped jeans and old sneakers. Just a mess. And the guy comes up to me and he goes, you know, hey, you got any change, spare any change? And, uh, <laughs> and he said, you know, actually, we're kind of low ourselves, you know, could you spare a few for, <laughs> for a six of Budweiser or something? I was done. The guy gave him money. He gave us money. And he was like, yeah, sure. He took out, took out these huge things, coins, just dumped it into our hands. And he was like, there you go. And then the two of them get into a debate about God about existence. And this guy said something about the way he has carved his, he stamped his name on, on this life is by carving his name into a subway car in New York City. I thought, Jesus Christ, we're talking to this guy, I don't know, it was like 2.30 in the morning. I was, I think I was in shock. He was really, um, he was really having a battle with God. That whole time we were together, he was, he was mad at God, and he wanted to prove that he didn't exist. But he believed that he existed. He had to believe, he had to have faith that God existed, or else he didn't have any meaning in his life. But yet he wasn't religious, so I didn't really truly understand what it was he was getting at. And I believe in God, and I'm definitely spiritual, but at the time, I think we were debating about Catholicism. And I told him I believed in God, and he told me to fuck off. He was the best. It's just I didn't understand him completely. That was one of the debates he got into with Ms. Anderson. And um, I mean, basically, the death is as meaningless as life. So if life has no meaning, death has no meaning. And that if there is, hang on, let me finish that thought first. If life is meaningless, and death is meaningless, then the whole thing is meaningless, and why do we even exist? But he had a hard time with his father passing away, so he wanted to understand why he was still emotional. He didn't understand why he was still emotional, basically, about his father passing away. Because he felt that if death was meaningless, then he shouldn't feel anything. And he did. He felt really lost and really abandoned. And his mother was pretty much absent. But, well, he started off having lunches with Ms. Anderson at the Great Throne. And then somehow, I don't know, it became us. It wasn't any longer the two of them. I really didn't mind the two of them being friends. They were really good friends. And I think she was good for him. Because she could take him out of his head. 
and she could almost calm him down. She could let him know that it was all right to be him, who he was. But I made him laugh. I mean, that was the best part about our relationship. We made each other laugh. I think that I think he felt that the graveyard was a peaceful place. I think he found solace there for some reason. I mean, it's not for me, but I definitely wanted to be with him, so wherever he wanted to go, I'd go. And we'd have lunch there. Sometimes it would be for hours, though. We'd sometimes watch the sunset there. Once the sun went down, I was like, no, I'm getting too spooked. <laughs> Gotta go. Gotta leave. But he, um, he had too many problems that I couldn't understand. And so many times he would just start yelling at me. Because I didn't understand, because I didn't know. I didn't know what to say to calm him down. I didn't know. So I, uh, I'd argue back. What did I know, you know? <laughs> it's in my mid, early 20s, whatever. I didn't know how to handle it. So bright, too. Some of the arguments we got into. My head was spinning by the time he left, and I'd say, well, what the hell are we arguing about? And one time he, uh, he left, and I found him on top of the, um, Oh, what was that place called? Yeah, well, after one of our arguments, I figured he'd gone there. So many times I went up there looking for him, but this time I knew he was gone. And uh, he was there, crying, yelling at me that I didn't know how to help him. And of course, I didn't know how to help him. He liked it up there. It's a really nice view. I don't know, sometimes I, I think maybe I'm being too insensitive because I didn't know what he was thinking and I didn't know how to help him. It seemed like all I could do was just be there for him and listen and I thought that was enough. But so many times he let me know that it wasn't enough, that I needed to give him more, that I needed to be more, you know, this or that or more loving or more understanding or, you know, more intellectual. I didn't know what he wanted at the time. But he was so cute. He's really cute. I guess when, when the dark clouds kind of went away, he helped me to see that it was just, that life was meaningless and that really all you gotta do is have fun and laugh. That it was okay. That we'd all be all right. That everything would work out. He helped me to see that everything was gonna be okay. That, uh, I don't know. I can't say he was definitely Mr. Positive Attitude, but sometimes, when he was having a good day, that was the most probably I got out of him.